Great Britain, June 19, 2015. A criminal makes headlines. Biochemistry student Emmanuel Kalijai is tried for the murder of his mother, whom he stabbed more than 40 times. Emmanuel Kalijai dressed up in his mother's pink tracksuit to create an alibi for himself and to pretend that she was still alive. All the British tabloids said it was the new Norman Bates, the new psycho. That shows how deeply the character of Norman Bates is anchored in popular culture. Norman Bates, the cult anti-hero of the film Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock, the most famous knife killer in cinema history. A shower and music that no one has forgotten. An historic scene that has been reproduced and parodied hundreds of times. I think, quite honestly, that the part that I think is so interesting to me is that, in, whether it be Hannibal Lecter or, or, or Norman Bates, is how much the audience likes them. They like them. They, they have an affection for them. Five actors have brought Norman Bates to life on the screen. Anthony Perkins and Vince Vaughn for the cinema. And two former child stars of television. Henry Thomas, escapee from E.T. And young Freddie Highmore, who went from the cute kid in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to the increasingly psychotic young man in the Bates Motel. I guess it's a great family story you know, a pretty odd family, but a, but a family story nonetheless that, that has all of those interpersonal relationships that people connect to that, that's timeless. From Halloween costumes to T-shirts, not forgetting shower curtains, the clues point to the same conclusion. Norman Bates is one of the most iconic serial killers in pop culture. Whose smile still hides many dark secrets. Los Angeles in the 1950s. Back then, Hollywood had but one obsession, to export the American dream to fight the evil communists. The heroes of science fiction movies were, more often than not, proud Americans fighting monsters or aliens, a reflection of the anxieties linked to the Cold War and a possible nuclear catastrophe. When the latest Alfred Hitchcock was shown in cinemas in 1960, it jarred somewhat. It was neither film noir or science fiction, and it wasn't really a horror movie, a kind of psychological thriller that came out of nowhere. American Patrick McGilligan is the reference when it comes to the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. It's a real, you know, benchmark film. That character was very carefully crafted to be a template, you know, of a type, a certain kind of person, maybe a rare person, you know, but nonetheless, a certain kind of person that once we have seen him becomes familiar to us and, and becomes someone we can never forget. Norman Bates is, in a way, the first modern serial killer, both in novels and in fiction. 
He's a kind of forerunner, even though Jack the Ripper came before him, a precursor of modern serial killers. A Mr. Average who commits insane acts with a macabre ritual. It's also a character that has been adapted and filmed countless times since 1960. This is the very latest Norman Bates, Freddy Highmore. He's the hero of the series Bates Motel, which takes us back to the character's origins. It's been more interesting, I guess, to show him you know, smiling and, and relaxing in those happy moments, the sort of most delicious ones to play are when uh, you know what's you know what's gonna come what's gonna come. You have that sort of impending sense of doom and tragedy, but he doesn't quite get it in the moment. Uh, and even if he's smiling perfectly naturally, viewers will will interpret it as something a little more than that because they know who he really is. Yeah. Norman Bates. A name that still sounds like a knife through flesh. A character that did not come from Hitchcock's imagination. Norman Bates. His name appeared several years earlier in a novel by Robert Bloch, author of crime and fantasy novels. Stephen Bourgoin, a writer specialized in the study of serial killers, knew Robert Bloch well. After meeting several times, the two men became friends, so much so that the writer eventually became godfather to Stéphane Bourgoin's son. Robert Bloch, in 1957, Robert Bloch was living in Wisconsin in a very small village located around 40 miles from the same Plainfield, Wisconsin, where Ed Gein operated. Ed Gein, an anonymous local farmer, was the chief model for Norman Bates's personality. Ed Gein was a man born in America in 1906 who grew up in a problem family. The father was alcoholic, permanently unemployed, and he beat his wife. His wife would roll on the floor screaming and praying to the Lord to have her husband die as soon as possible. He grew up on a farm initially. Then his parents changed occupation and bought a butcher's business. So Gein began, when he was six or seven years old, seeing bloody scenes on a daily basis. He'd see his mother cutting up pigs, ripping out their entrails. To him, it was a daily event. Ed Gein had a big secret. Deep down, it was his passionate desire to become a woman. But instead of quietly pulling on stockings and a dress at home, he disinterred women's bodies to dismember them. Gein was looking for something fundamentally simple in these graves. That is, he wanted to change into a woman so he would salvage the faces of these women he had selected. He would salvage the breasts, he'd recover the vulvas, and then he'd make masks. He made himself a torso from various pieces salvaged here and there, which he'd wear on the night of the full moon and dance in his garden or in the woods. The cemetery soon lost its interest for Ed Gein. He then turned to the women in his circle of friends, who were quite alive. I think we can estimate around a dozen additional victims by adding all the disappearances and all the corpses recovered at his place for which there has never been any explanation. Upon his arrest in 1957, Americans were struck by the atrocity of his crimes. Ed Gein immediately became an horrific legend fueled by a fascinated press. Like a character from a horror tale, there are nursery rhymes and songs devoted to him. There'll be Gein where that's made of and bomb ladies, a habit of frying pan and lips on a string, some scraps and fats and skeletons as sure as you're born. The ugliest of all was you.
Ed Gein, killer and handyman, would make everyday objects out of the skin of his victims, like this leather chair, for example. Amazed to learn that these crimes took place just a few kilometers from his home, writer Robert Bloch's imagination kicked in. Right away, he was struck by this new story. And in seven weeks, without interruption, he finished Psycho, the novel. Over this footage from Stéphane Bourgoin's personal archives, Robert Bloch opened up about the American media's fascination for serial killers. I think that the media is culpable. To a great extent, in the... Culpable to a great extent in its handling of the phenomena of serial killers. There's a sensationalism injected into these cases. And there's very little restraint when it comes to lengthy positions on attitudes, backgrounds, and the persona of the killer. And the persona of the killer. True to his convictions, Robert Bloch didn't commit to paper a carbon copy of Ed Gein. He cherry-picked certain horrific details of his story and invented a much more fascinating character. His pen transformed Ed Gein from farmer into motel owner, one who suffered from a split personality. He baptized his fictional character, Norman Bates. The first two words the reader sees upon opening the book, Psycho. He told me that Norman was close to normal, someone who is normal in his abnormality. So he wanted him to resemble Mr. Average. Bates, he once told me, was a neighbor from his village that he hated, who had a dog, or two dogs, I don't recall. And these dogs barked all the time and woke him up at night. And when he asked him to quieten his dog or dogs, the dispute got pretty nasty. So it was his revenge on a bad-tempered neighbor. The novel was finished in 1959. Yet despite the public's taste for the sordid misdeeds of Ed Gein, the book Psycho received a lukewarm reception. But one extremely favorable critique appeared in the New York Times, a newspaper read daily by Alfred Hitchcock. Mr. Bloch proved that a plausible story about mental illness could terrify and chill the blood. In the 1950s, Hitchcock released back-to-back -back hits, Rear Window, Vertigo, North by Northwest. At the same time, he enjoyed scaring television audiences with his cult show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. His aim in 1959 was to shoot a low-key film with his TV crew, but without the economic constraints that went with major productions. And with the novel Psycho, he finally found his next subject. Norman Bates reminded him of another famous serial killer in his native England, Jack the Ripper. Hitchcock got this fascination with um, strange, creepy serial killers uh, from his uh, boyhood because he was raised in the same area of England that Jack the Ripper terrorized uh, women and killed them. And uh, that had happened before he was born. Um, Nobody had uh, caught Jack the Ripper, as far as anyone knew for sure, still to this day. Uh, and Jack the Ripper was, uh, his name was spoken, you know, in that area all the time. Every few years, he goes all the way back to Jack the Ripper, and he brings it forward in time, making it contemporary. So when he sits around, you know, in about 1959, reading Robert Bloch's novel, I'm sure he went. Hitchcock immediately bought the rights to the book. Robert Bloch's agent received an offer of $9,500, unaware with whom he was actually negotiating. 
It was Hitchcock's habit to conceal his identity when buying the rights. So Robert Bloch's agent receives a blind proposal covering the book's adaptation for the screen. He's told it will be shot in black and white, so he automatically thinks it's a low-budget film, even though the letterhead is that of a major company, Universal Pictures. The script remained faithful to the plot of the novel, but one crucial detail was changed. In the novel, Bates was a plump, rather disturbing man of around 40. On his screenwriter Joseph Stefano's initiative, Hitchcock turned him into a clean-cut young man, the kind of person about whom you'd say, oh, he wouldn't hurt a fly. Hitchcock then set his sights on an actor who was creating a buzz in the industry back then. Young Anthony Perkins. Tony Perkins was not unknown, so I'm sure Hitchcock was watching him and thinking about him, and then this part came along, and uh, together with his writers, uh, and always the first writers are him and Alma, he and his wife. I'm sure they looked at Tony Perkins while they were thinking about who they were going to turn into the Norman Bates of the film. The Hitchcocks were intrigued by the sexual ambiguity given off by Anthony Perkins. A troubling impression that would be put to great use in the character of Norman Bates. Wow, he took Tony Perkins. And then as time goes on and Tony Perkins, we realize is, is gay or bisexual or what, however he defined himself, eventually he was married, uh, that uh, Hitchcock's casting was genius. Elite. In a way, he's the most lifelike killer we know. Because when we represent them or tell their stories, it's always staged in an exceptional way. They have a particular face, a certain look. They have a different disposition. They're extraordinary. So extraordinary that they spare us, the ordinary ones. But he's just like us. I don't think there's ever been a more insignificant killer. It reminds me of these reports. When they question someone who turns out to be a dangerous terrorist or, or an assassin, what do the neighbors say? Oh no, he was nice. Yes, he'd always say good morning. That's what we always hear. For the leading female role, Alfred Hitchcock wanted the star Janet Lee. Her cold, fantastical blonde beauty was exactly what the filmmaker loved. And on this movie, he was eager to push back the boundaries of what was politically correct for the time. Viewers were attracted by the fact that we saw Janet Lee in a bra on the poster for the movie, which was groundbreaking. We saw her twice in a bra in the movie, and he showed a toilet flushing on screen, something that had never been done. But Alfred Hitchcock's ultimate stroke of genius was to eliminate the character played by Janet Lee after only 30 minutes. First, Marion Crane, who runs off with the stolen money. We start pulling for her and bang, she's murdered after 20 or 30 minutes. Yes, the viewers are totally stunned because we usually identify with the main character who is on screen for 20, 25 minutes. And suddenly, the heroine disappears. She's murdered in an ultra-violent way. And what we thought was the dramatic device of the movie, the theft of this money, disappears completely. Ensuite, then Hitchcock, he turns the situation around, shifting our allegiance behind Norman Bates, who appears to be a poor boy trying to redeem his mother's disgusting acts by cleaning up the blood and moving the body. The shoot went by at breakneck speed, and in just a few months, by the end of 1959, the film was in the can. Then, Hitchcock's sole concern was to preserve the mystery around Norman Bates and the evil eating away at him. If the secret of his split personality were to get out, it would kill the film's suspense and its final twist. So to avoid leaks, 
Hitchcock ordered his assistant to buy all available copies of Psycho from bookstores. And to perpetuate the mystery, he drew inspiration from his French alter ego, Henri-Georges Clouseau. Clouseau came along with Diabolique. He, you know, sat up and said, mm, pretty good, you know. When Les Diaboliques came out, on the posters, Clouseau had directly instructed his viewers to keep the plot secret. Don't be diabolical. Don't spoil your friend's interest in this movie by telling them what you have seen. They'll thank you for it. Impressed, Hitchcock would do exactly the same for Psycho. This will enable you to better savor Psycho. And when you've seen the movie, don't reveal the ending. It's the only one we have. Clouseau was undoubtedly emulating Hitchcock, not, not the other way around. And what Hitchcock did was go after the writers of, and it's a much more Hitchcockian strategy, strategy to go after the writers of Diabolique and then, and then uh, get their material for Vertigo. Mystery, sex, disturbing drama. From the movie's release, all the ingredients were in place to make Norman Bates the icon of crime he has subsequently become. They asked all the movie critics to send them their articles before they appeared in the media. So there really was a blackout on Norman Bates and his mother. This created such anticipation that from the very first screenings there were gigantic lines outside the theaters. It was then in, in 1960 uh, a real th thunderclap. I mean, it was uh, it was a tremendous, tremendous success. It was a tremendous controversy. Uh, people discussed it. There were newspaper editorials. There were columnists who wrote about it. There were people who condemned it. Uh, Hitchcock had to explain it. Uh, you know, usually slyly and amusingly. Um, and uh, people thought it was an immoral film. So it's a real, you know, benchmark film. It's a benchmark film. And then if you look at it and what makes it great, which is what people do, uh, you know, it, it partly begins with, uh, for the characters, at least in the story, with Norman Bates. Psycho soon became Alfred Hitchcock's biggest box office success, ranked just behind Ben-Hur as the year's box office champion. Produced for less than a million dollars, it amassed 50 times that. 22 years later, in 1982, gore-laden slashers were in fashion. Universal Pictures launched Psycho 2, with Anthony Perkins as Norman Bates, of course, who has now left the asylum and gone home to his motel. But, we suspect, not quite cured. The movie was a summer surprise hit, so in 1986, a no-brainer, the producers released Psycho 3, with, of course, Anthony Perkins in a film where Norman Bates is back to normal, but mother's off her rocker again. This time, there's a Bates overdose. The film is a box office flop. So it was on television that Psycho 4 came into being, with, of course, Anthony Perkins in the role of old Norman, and little Elliot from E.T. as his teenage version. A foretaste of the series Bates Motel. The writer, Robert Bloch, didn't even bother to watch these sequels, made without permission. Robert Bloch is très amer. Robert Bloch was very bitter. He never had a high opinion of Hollywood. But they took his work, his character, the psychology of his character without his say-so, and without him earning any royalties on the character either. It sounds staggering, but that's how it is. So he decided to take his revenge, in inverted commas, by writing a sequel to Psycho, and then a third sequel to Psycho. In his novel Psycho 2, he takes his own style of revenge on the Hollywood movie industry by parachuting Norman Bates into the shooting of a film about his life. Each character is admirably bumped off. Norman Bates takes an almost experimental turn in 1998 when Gus Van Sant tackles an almost shot-for-shot -shot remake of the movie Psycho, but this time in color, with Vince Vaughn playing Norman. But the experiment was cut short by the box office, as the title made only $21 million for an investment of $60 million. I think that film, Gus Van Sant's 
uh, explains the reason why there can only be one psycho. Though there's only one psycho, Norman Bates made a successful return on the A&E cable channel in 2013 in the series Bates Motel. But the success of a 50-year-old movie isn't enough to explain this enduring fascination for Norman Bates. Norman has become an icon just like Marilyn, an icon whose face can be tattooed on the body. And there are other symbolic clues, which have turned Norman Bates as schizophrenic, as worrying as he is seductive, into an unforgettable icon of crime. Norman Bates is indissociable from his motel, almost a character in its own right, which participates in the legend of its psychopathic hero. The motel, which appears more than ever as the focus of all terrors, made in USA, where the monsters of the past lurk, and of the unconscious. In 1960, in a humorous trailer, Hitchcock used his fame and his famous silhouette to publicize his film and his famous motel. Here we have a quiet little motel, tucked away off the main highway, and as you see, perfectly harmless looking. When in fact, it has now become known as the scene of the crime. Present day Vancouver. The city, the sea, the mountains and the sometimes schizophrenic weather, going from the chilling winter sunshine to what the Canadians call the West Fog. This is where they film the series that has modernized the Norman Bates character. The TV show's producers have understood the prominence given to the motel in the popular perception surrounding their hero by entitling the series Bates Motel. The Bates House, the motel, everything evokes the legendary film of Alfred Hitchcock. Today, the local weather perfectly reflects Norman's tortured spirit. It's very cold. <laughs> You thought, as, you, as you, you can't really tell on the camera, but it is, um, yes, it adds, they like a shooting in the winter in Vancouver, because it certainly adds that sense of Im impending doom and, uh, and dark, gray, you know, horrible skies. Yeah, it gets you in the mood. <laughs> the series concentrates on Norman Bates's teenage years. His mother, Norma, is both beautiful and alive. And this disturbing prequel to Psycho takes place in our time. Well, the first, the very first time, of course, with the sign and the motel and the, you know, the imposing house now, it looks incredibly iconic and just like from Psycho. It feels like it has some sense of history and I think that's what you get by being on a, on a TV show that you look around you and some things are just the visual tricks of like building a roof and others are like, oh, you remember when that sign was no longer there or when they didn't have free Wi-Fi at Bates Motel or when, yes. um, you know, the office was slightly different and you kind of know, and, and when you go back inside in, in the studio, it kind of feels like home and it has that real weight of history that you remember all those scenes that, that happened and, and what's sort of really taken place for you, yeah. The origin of the word motel is easy to find. Just combine motor and hotel. A motel is an odd concept born in the USA that allows you to park your car right opposite your room, to be ready to leave at first light. Mark S. Freeborn is production designer on the series Bates Motel. He's used to shows where the decor must underline the character's madness, having worked for four years on the series Breaking Bad. In some ways, especially the Bates Motel, harks back to the, the real golden age of, of what America used to be. It was a beacon in the night for them. It was a home away from home. It spoke of comfort and protection. A motel has a very special place in American uh, mythology because uh, America is a place of vast distances and uh, the American dream or the American idea of the American dream is that you can go anywhere and do anything, take a vacation. 
And so every American knows the idea of pulling into a weird motel in the middle of the night. Um, and most Americans would be fooled into the same situation because uh, we're, uh, motels are little sanctuaries on the road, you know. In those days, the only thing on the roads were little motels, um, not expensive. Uh, they couldn't be expensive if you're traveling with your family on a vacation. Although things have changed significantly over the past 50 years or so, there is still an element of that that exists. Uh, um, abandoned motels have a tremendous fascination for tourists and me. Over the years, motels have lost their splendor. Cheap, convenient, and anonymous. They quickly became the refuge of outlaws. In the 1950s, the FBI listed all the motels in the country so as to closely monitor all citizens that may present problems. These are places that are outside of other places, off the beaten track, where the rules are being broken. They embody what might happen to us both for better and for worse. There are also places we link with outlaws in the sense of transgression and illegitimacy. They're places for sexual trysts. You don't meet your husband or wife in a motel. Linking Norman Bates's murderous madness to his motel, so recognizable and so intimately linked to American mythology, is one of his creator's masterstrokes. You pass through motels. You stay one night, if you're lucky enough to survive, especially at the Bates Motel. And in this motel is the most famous crime scene in the history of the cinema. A crime imitated a thousand times, but never equaled. One which clings to the icon, Norman Bates. The scene of the crime? The bathroom. Well, they cleaned all this up now. Big difference. You should have seen the blood. This rapidly cut footage took seven days of work out of a total shoot of three weeks, more than 70 takes and over $60,000. A huge amount of work for just 45 seconds of film, which shows the fundamental importance of this scene in Hitchcock's eyes. The viewer, in the position of voyeur, will viciously watch this naked woman be murdered in the shower becoming, through the camera, her murderer and her executioner. He becomes Norman Bates. I wouldn't say that Hitchcock is perverse, I'd say he's very clever. That he puts us in an extremely uncomfortable position. What if we were just a little bit the killer, capable of this impulsive outburst of violence? I think it involves us in an extremely disturbing way, and it can be enjoyable, which perhaps is the most disturbing aspect. We're really in a kind of penetration, in the most intense sense of the term. It's insistent, it's like a battering in all senses. This isn't a little death, it's actual death. With stabbing and cutting and blood spurting, a metaphor for the other thing that spurts. It's very sexual, but you can read lots into it. And maybe you imagine more than you see. I think that's the big strength of this scene. You don't actually see much, in fact. The editing of the shower sequence is pretty staggering. 
In those days, it was relatively rare to see such jerky or strident editing. It's this roughness of cutting and splicing that makes us think the sequence is more violent than it really is. So it's something that smacks us in the face. You cannot deny it. With this scene, Alfred Hitchcock is playing with cinematic censorship. Imposed by the very strict Hayes Code, guarantor of the values of Puritan America until the 1960s. They had a lot of arguments and, uh, with the censors about how to do that scene. Again, he's telling them, oh, you'll never see anything. It's going to be quick cuts and she won't be nude. She'll have a flesh-colored bathing suit on. And, and, uh, and people are still arguing about exactly how the scene was cut. But, or shot, but you know, you don't see brass, uh, it's all quick cuts, you think you see everything. We can hear, we see the curtain moving, but each time the knife descends, we change shots. You think you saw it stabbing, but you didn't. You only see blood at the end. And black and white was convenient then because it allowed them to use melted chocolate to show the consistency of blood, but without its color, obviously. But most surprising of all, in this scene, it's not the actor playing Norman Bates, Anthony Perkins, who is holding the knife. Retained in New York by a Broadway role, he was replaced by his body double. At the end of his life, the actor declared, it is rather strange to go through life being identified with this sequence, knowing that it was my double. Today, the scene is still regularly parodied. As in this faithful remake, in a Lego version. It's even been used for comedy in this French series. Madame Hitchcock, une baignoire, ça coûte cher, surtout si on veut quelque chose qui a un peu d'allure. Et si on tournait la scène dans une douche? Ah oui, mais dans le scénario, il y a marqué une baignoire. Mais je me contrefous du scénario, mon petit bonhomme. Si ça coûte moins cher de tourner dans le trou du cul de Jennifer, on tournera dans le trou du cul de Jennifer, c'est clair mmh, Je suis pas sûr qu'il y a cette place. Latterly, Jamie Lee Curtis, Janet Lee's own daughter, parodied the shower scene for the series Scream Queens. On a black and white snapshot posted on the social networks, she is proudly holding the photo of her mother. The series Bates Motel obviously enjoys the reputation of this scene, teasing out the wait for fans over the seasons. What they're waiting for is Freddie Highmore as Norman Bates to present his version of the fateful scene. Yeah, the shower scene, it will have to be down here. Um, I think it's, I'm sure that, I mean, there, there already have been various, you know, winks and things that um, references to, to Psycho. And again, with, you know, in comparing my version of, of Norman Bates to Anthony Perkins's one, it's getting that balance between it being um, too self-aware that it takes people out of the, the sort of Bates Motel world itself, um, but whilst at the same time kind of hinting at it and, and finding ways in, in doing or redoing or hinting at the shower scene, but without it being as explicit as, um, you know, that remake of Psycho that kind of copied every single shot. Yes. <laughs> a famous crime scene in a cult setting. These are the elements that have turned Norman Bates into an icon who left an indelible mark on pop culture. But the character of Bates is first and foremost a bloodthirsty killer whose evil is psychological in origin a split personality who continues to feed the myth. I guess he's very close to his mother and... Too close. <laughs> and maybe too close to his mother. I think that's what it's all about. It's a love story in a way that goes terribly wrong and is perhaps inappropriate, but a love story nonetheless between Norman and his mother. The legend of Norman Bates is indissociable from the murder of his own mother, Norma, found mummified at the end of Alfred Hitchcock's movie. 
This head, whose only vestiges of human life reside in this skillfully constructed Shino. The love between Norman and his mother was undying. Or perhaps it went beyond that. At the end of the 50s, fascinated by the mechanisms of the unconscious, Alfred Hitchcock found in Norman Bates the character who would crystallize all his obsessions. Madness, sexual frustration, and murderous violence. Obsessions that struck a chord in his audience. Back then, Freudian theory was highly fashionable. The famous Oedipus complex was on everyone's lips. The unconscious desire of a child to sleep with the parent of the opposite sex. Hitchcock took a lead character for the first time and made him a psychotic of some sort. Um, and uh, that was uh, for an A movie, meaning not a B movie, uh, because maybe you could say earlier that in various B movies we had psychotic characters. But to take a lead character and a handsome lead character and make him a psychotic, that's something else that movie was doing you know, that is historical. This young man, you had to feel sorry for him. After all, being dominated by an almost maniacal woman was enough to drive anyone to the extreme of, uh, uh, well, let's go in. If the unstable relationship between Norman Bates and his mother is only one of the elements of the film Psycho, the series Bates Motel chose to make it its main focus. Of course, there's that sense of, of Freud and the, the Oedipus complex, but I feel at the same time, it's not as uh, almost clear cut, perhaps, in terms of it being this one way directional you know, the Oedipus complex always talks about, you know, the, the, the love for the mother. And I think in what makes it so interesting and complex in Bates Motel is that it's, it's, it's mutual. And of course, there are sort of sexual barriers that it crosses and, and mostly from, from Norman's point of view. But, but there is this incredibly strong bond and, and need for each other that both Norman and Norman have that goes, that goes beyond Norman just desiring his mother. Norma and Norman, a toxic duo, where frustration and sexual promiscuity gradually dragged Norman towards madness. This mother-son duo is psychically dangerous in the sense that, well, already it's dangerous for any young man who completely becomes his mother's ultimate goal, his only reason for living, his passion. Here, the term castrator wouldn't be misplaced. She cut off everything he had. Any semblance of independence, pleasure, desire, because desire takes you elsewhere. It forces you to look around you, to see other people than mummy. The way I imagine this duo, she prevented everything, closed off everything. The relationship is unbelievably complex, and uh, I think it's confusing to figure out who the disturbed one is, whether in fact it's Norman, Norman or it's simply both of them. But um, it's incredibly uh, complex, and. Uh, and she's uh, loving and yet she's manipulative and uh, the relationship is comedic and incestuous. For instance, there is a door connecting Norman and Norma's bedrooms. There's a vent, an air vent over that door. So there's, if you made a noise in your bedroom, I could hear that noise through that air vent. That's odd. In the movie Psycho, the viewer only realizes at the end that Norman Bates ended up killing his mother. Steeped in guilt, he stuffed her to give himself the illusion of her presence. This monstrous stuffed head that we can still see at the Museum of the Cinema in Paris is just like those animals frozen in time that we can see in each room of the Bates house. Taxidermy is another symbol that the Bates Motel series has taken on.
guess it's his hobby. You know, every every a taxidermy is Norman's hobby. Everyone needs a needs a good good hobby, something to occupy their mind. Yes. Yeah. It's pretty weird, isn't it? <laughs> I know, you should just be like playing football out on the... It just doesn't seem to quite fit somehow, but maybe it'd be fun, you know. Norman, like, practising keepy-uppies out on the grass or, like, scoring goals past Norma. Um, maybe in a, in a different version. If only that could have been the case and he hadn't have chosen taxidermy, yeah. My personal opinion on Norman and taxidermy is he uh, is, is obsessed with it because he's a lonely soul. And he's found something that allows him a little bit, a, a little bit of contact with souls that are possibly departed. But there is, there, there are a few people out there who, who, are actually more comfortable with dead creatures than they are with live, and I think that that's that's Norman Norman's spirit. He 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 knows that anything he creates is not going to hurt him. He knows he's going to make them better. His first taxidermy was a dog that was killed in the road. So in a, a sense, he was saving that creature by stuffing her. Norman Bates is saving his mother, making her immortal. He then develops a triple personality. In the books, series, and films, he in turn takes himself to be the adolescent in love with his mother. Then, his mother. And then, adult Norman, who tries as best as he can to run his motel, the most normal side of his personality. Norman is fascinating because he's, on the surface, a very sweet kid. Uh, his heart, he has a loving heart. He wants his life to be a good life. He wants it to be better than his parents' life. Uh, but he just can't. There's a little part of him that's broken. There are always areas of shadow with Norman Bates. Areas of shadow that beg to be explored. His demented, tortured spirit continues to travel through time. There's a few questions that haven't been answered for us about Norman as a killer. I don't think that we'll ever know until the very end of the series. The name of Norman Bates has crossed the eras, but for him, there'd be no fight club, no black swan, no schizophrenic murderous anti-hero. There are a few characters in the history of film that you could go on the street with a pole and ask the public, who, who is Norman Bates? Uh, you, I'm not sure how many, but you'd get some, you know, who would know actually his name. That's how powerful it is. And Anthony Perkins, I don't know what happened when he died, but I'm sure they said Norman Bates died. Norman Bates survived his first leading man and continues to live on behind the features of Freddie Highmore. As I get older, I guess Norman, Norman gets older too. Um, and hopefully we're just not destined towards the same <laughs> end. <laughs> The smile of Norman Bates remains legendary. What's the betting that he still hasn't said his last word?